Hello and welcome back to part 2 of the Tortoise TDS fully explained series. In this part 2 we will look into the autoregressive model which is a GPT-2 model so it is a large language model if you want and and parts of what we will learn you can also apply to other large language models like ChatGPT or the Llama models so it's not only specific to the Tortoise architecture and while the first part was more a theoretical introduction now we will start using code and step by step going through how we can generate speech using the Tortoise architecture. All right, and now I would say we just jump right into it. All right, and as you can see, I prepared a Jupyter notebook in which I have documented all the steps for the remaining parts. I will link this document in the description box and feel free to download it and run it yourself, either on your own computer or, for example, a Colab notebook or Kaggle notebook, whatever you prefer or have access to. But I would recommend you using a GPU and I will be using an NVIDIA GPU, which we can see here. So I can type in NVIDIA minus SMI, which you can see here. And there it's stated, I'm using an NVIDIA RTX 6800 generation GPU, which NVIDIA was kind enough to send me to support my channel. So shout out to NVIDIA, many thanks for that, which will help me creating more videos for you guys. And it's overall like a very powerful GPU with 48 gigabytes of VRAM, as you can see here. The GPU has 568 tensor cores and the memory bandwidth of 960 gigabytes per second. All right, and now the first step is to install all required modules and libraries. So for this, we will check out and clone the Git repository of the Tortoise TDS library. Then we will jump into the Tortoise TDS folder, install all required Python modules, and then install the Tortoise TDS module running the setup.py file. And I added these statements to keep the output clean. In case you run in issues, make sure to remove those statements so you get a more verbose output of potential errors. All right, and now I will just run this cell by typing command enter. All right, this was successful. For me, it took around one to two minutes. So be a little bit patient when running this cell. Now we can move on to step zero, which is download model weights and initialize all models. What we will do here by running this, where we initialize the text-to-speech tortoise model. And this will download all the models used by the tortoise architecture from the Hugging Face Hub where those model weights are stored. We will also use the KV cache, which we will cover later. And those inputs we will use throughout the entire series of videos. And I thought we'd rather do the imports at once in the beginning. And this is a util function that allows us to temporarily load a model to VRAM. And then we can offload the model to RAM after execution, which kind of means we can use a model for inference for a certain amount of time. And once we are done using the model, we can offload it again to the CPU RAM, which allows support for the Tortoise architecture also for GPUs that have less VRAM. All right, and now by pressing Command Enter, we can again run the cell. And I promise you, this is just the build up, the initial start, so we can see the models are downloaded now and soon it will get more interesting. All right, now that all models are downloaded, as you can see here, we can move on to the next step, which is define text and voice for which speech is to be generated, which basically means we can define here the text as input string. Feel free to adjust this to your own needs or interests, whatever. And then I picked one of the voices from the voices folder inside the Tortoise library. So you can jump to the GitHub repository and then Tortoise TDS, Tortoise voices, and here you have a good amount of different voice styles that you can use out of the box so you don't have to upload your own voices. Obviously, if you, for example, want to use your own voice, it would be beneficial to record it and upload it so you can use your own voice samples. I've already described this in a former video, so feel free to check this out if you're interested in that too. I just decided to go with the voice Tom, which I believe is the voice of Tom Hanks, but I'm not entirely sure. And what we then can do is using the load voice method, which allows us to load the voice files inside the Tom folder. So these waveform audio files. And now we can also analyze them. So you can see they're loaded as tensors. And I'm sure those tensors have a different length because some files are longer, some are shorter. So what we can do is just analyze the shape of the first one, which we can see here. So if we dividing it by the sampling rate it was used, we can see this is an 11 second wave file. While if we apply this one, we can see this is even 14 seconds yeah, and so on. So we can kind of see how long those files are. And if you don't believe me, feel free to download those files and run them yourself and check if this time is correct. And what we will do then is calculate the latent vector, which characterizes the voice in the given samples. So 
Here we use the get conditioning latents function and under the hood there's a lot going on which I described here in this command. So what we can see is we pass a list of audio samples which we saw here each as a tensor of a particular voice. Obviously those samples should be all of the same voice. And what's happening then is first the audio samples are clipped to six seconds length. What's happening then is either it's padded with zero values or if the audio sample, which is the case for those, are longer than six seconds, they're randomly shortened. And then those six seconds audio samples are converted to a MEL spectrogram, which we already saw in part one, what a MEL spectrogram is. And based on these MEL spectrograms, a speaker embedding is computed. And overall those embeddings kind of allow the model to store more information to assess those voice features inside this embedding. So we have aspects like voice, intonation, acoustic, maybe accent stored in such an embedding. And we will compute embeddings for the autoaggressive model as an input and for the diffusion decoder as you saw in part one. And what is then done as a final step is to calculate the mean of all speaker embeddings to get the final speaker embedding. So we saw here we have four different samples and for each of them we will calculate an embedding and afterwards we take all four embeddings and calculate their mean. So if you imagine we have a latent space and they're all kind of close to each other, you can just imagine it as kind of a cluster and then we take the center of the cluster which is the mean of those individual embeddings. And this is then the representation of the voice overall. And these speaker or voice embeddings we calculate for the GPT as a conditioning or the autoaggressive model and the diffusion decoder or diffusion model as a conditioning. And if we have a look at the overall architecture again, we can see that this is basically step two. So we have one input for the autoaggressive transformer and one input for the diffusion decoder, which we will use at a later stage, but already compute here. And then we can move on to the autoregressive model or the GPT-2 model. And I just have written down the overall flow that we will now follow along, which is first, we transform the voice samples to speaker embeddings, which we already have done here with the GPT conditioning. Then we will tokenize the text and transform the tokens to text embeddings. The voice samples are already in an embedding representation. So we also want to transform our input text to text embeddings which the autoregressive model is then able to process. Then we will stack both the speaker embedding and the text embeddings as an input sequence. And based on this input sequence, kind of the information that we pass to the model, we then want to generate MEL tokens. So this is the flow for the next couple of steps. Okay, and now let's jump to step three, which is tokenizing the text and transforming the tokens to text embeddings. And for this first, we use the tokenizer. In case it's not super obvious to you what's happening here, what we can do is printing the text and then printing the tokens. So we have the tokenizer and encode our input text and get a sequence of tokens that represent our input text. So if we run this, we can see this is the text that I earlier defined. And those are the tokens that represent exactly this text. We can also decode this list to our input string again, just for you to get an idea of how this tokenizer works. So here you can see how this token list looks decoded and we can see that the tokenizer only processes characters in a lowercase format, which for a speech generating model makes sense because you can't hear if a word is written in uppercase or lowercase. So only using a lowercase representation decreases our vocabulary size. And what we will do then is create this token list as an integer tensor. This is just so our model can process it on the GPU. And what we also will do is prepend a beginning of sentence token which we have here as a start text token. So we can just copy this one, show it here, and we see it's just one specific number. So the stop text token has a value zero, and the start text token has a value 255. And we prepend the start text token and append the stop text token around our text tokens. And those are our text inputs as a sequence of tokens representing our input text. And what we then finally can do is transform this list or sequence of tokens to text embeddings, which allow the autoregressive model to understand the meaning of the individual tokens more effectively and also their relationship to other tokens or words. Transformer architectures, which the autoregressive model is using, are permutation invariant, meaning no matter which order the tokens are given as an input to the transformer, we will always get the same output. But obviously we wanna generate speech in exactly the order we input the text to the model. And to make sure that the model is able to understand that there is an order in our input sequence, we also add 
to our text embeddings a text positional embedding, which kind of just allows the model to understand that there is an order and knows the position of an individual token in the overall sequence. And for you to better understand what specifically is going on here, I printed out all those different variables. So we first have the text tokens here, then we have the text inputs where we prepend the start text token and append this end text token here. Then we convert it to text embeddings and we can see here that each of those tokens is transformed into a vector and those vectors actually are of size 1024. So a vector containing 1024 elements and this is done for each of those tokens. So we have our embeddings and in the same dimensionality we have the text positional embeddings and what we then do is element wise add them to our text embeddings. If we take this value plus this one we get exactly this number here. And this way we get our text embeddings and this is our pre-processed text input to the autoregressive model. All right, and now as a next step, we combine our speaker conditioning and the text embeddings as our total input into the autoregressive model. So here we have our GPT conditioning, the speaker embedding, and here we have our text embedding, characterizing the input text. And what we're now doing is using this unsqueeze method, which just adds one dimensionality to the speaker embedding to match the shape of the text embedding. And we can quickly check this by running the following statement, where we can see that the GPT conditioning or the speaker conditioning has one dimensionality less than the text embedding. And yeah, by adding this dimensionality here, both embeddings matches and then we can unify them as one input to our autoregressive model. And we have first the GPT conditioning and then our text embeddings. All right, and now as step five, we have to create fake inputs, which in the start, this was really hard for me to understand why we have to do this and why this step is relevant because we have just created our input embeddings and why will we now create something like fake inputs? And the reason is that this is due to the hugging face implementation of the GPT-2 model, or more specifically the generate function. And it expects as an input, a list of tokens. So our continuous input embedding, we can't really pass. So for this reason, we have to create the fake inputs tensor, which has the same size as our input embedding, which is here the first dimensionality, and this is the second. And actually I'm not entirely correct because we had one more element at the end of the second dimension, which will be the start mill token, which I will get you in a second. And this whole tensor is filled with one values. And what is kind of happening behind the scenes is that inside the tortoise architecture, a customized GPT-2 model is used, which allows us to bypass our input embedding. So those fake inputs are replaced by our input embedding. But for the sake of using the generate method, we still need to pass those fake inputs. So that's the whole reason why we define them. It's definitely confusing, but I hope that kind of makes sense to you. And we even add one element at the end of the input embeddings, which will be the start mill token. So with that, we pass our speaker embedding or conditioning, then our text inputs, which is the input to our autoregressive model. So it knows what it should generate mill tokens for. And then for the model to know that it should start generating mill tokens, we indicate this with the start mill token here. So during the training, the model always saw speaker conditioning, text embeddings, start mill token, and then started predicting the mill token. So it knows once in the sequence this token appears, afterwards it should generate mill tokens. And as a last thing, we will remember the length of our input, especially the first dimension. And with this later, when we have our generated sequence, where the input is also part of we use this as a truncation index. So kind of having the whole sequence as a result, we use the truncation index to only get the generated MEL tokens. All right, and now as the last step for this video, we can now finally generate MEL token sequences using the autoregressive model of the tortoise architecture. And for this, we first define the MEL sequence dimensionality, or more specifically, the length of the MEL token sequence that the model should generate. And here we kind of have to find a trade-off. Imagine you have a very short input text, for example, just six words, and each MEL token comprises 1 20th of a second. So here we have to find a length of 250, which is equal to 12.5 seconds of waveform audio in the output. If you have a very short input text, you don't even need all that many MEL tokens, right? For, for example, we don't need 12.5 seconds to speak six words, which can be done way faster. Just keep in mind if we had a value of 2000 and we would just like to generate speech for, let's say 10 words, then maybe 90% of the generated MEL token sequences are actually silent token or worthless MEL token that don't contribute to the generated speech. And 
Then as a next step, we can define how many MEL code sequences should be generated. And here it has to be said, the more sequences we generate, the more likely we will find one that perfectly aligns with our input text and with the given speaker conditioning. And I've made a small chart here where you can see the amount of generated sequences and the seconds it took. We can more or less see, given a little bit of variability, that there's a linear tendency. This is kind of the trade-off we have. Do you want high quality speech? in which case the generation takes longer, or do you rather have a faster generation, but potentially worse speech results. And then, as I mentioned earlier, this is the method to bypass our input embedding, which is then replacing the fake inputs internally, so that we can replace inside the autoregressive model the fake inputs with our input embedding. And then we define here as a padding token and end of string token, the stop mel token. So as soon as the model predicts the stop mel token, it stops generating the sequence. Here we just define the maximum amount of new tokens to be generated, the number of sequences to return. And here we say that we want to sample. So at each step for all the possible mel tokens, the autoregressive model calculates a probability distribution. And here we say, instead of taking the one with the highest probability, we sample through this probability distribution and we take the smallest subset that as a cumulative sum has 80% of the probability. So in this subset are only the most likely MEL tokens and in there we sample and the temperature indicates how diverse and creative the MEL token sequences are. So if we have a value that's close to zero, we get more or less always very similar sequences. While if we have a value that's above one, we get very diverse sequences that are very different from each other, but are also less likely to be perfect aligned with our input text and speaker conditioning. So point eight is a good trade-off value. And this parameter penalizes if the model repetitively predicts a token. So given, for example, the model predicted a MEL token with a value 40, it is less likely, given this repetition penalty, that it would generate the MEL token with a value 40 again, which can prevent that the model generates longer pauses or something like an uh, inside the speech. And once we have our output, we then truncate the output so we only get the generated MEL tokens, as I mentioned earlier, and in case the model didn't generate all the 250 MEL codes, we will add a padding so that our generated MEL codes are all of the length 250, which is important for part three, so that we can pass to the CLVP model an input batch where all the sequences have the same length. And yeah, that's basically it for this part. So now we have generated our MEL tokens and are definitely a step closer to our final generated speech. And we can also quickly have a look at them by just printing them. And here we can see that we have different MEL token sequences. And as you can see, they are all padded at the end with a stop MEL token that we have here, which has the value 8,193. And yeah, given these generated MEL code sequences in the next part, we will use the CVLP model to find the MEL token sequences that align best to our input text. So out of all the MEL token sequences that we have generated in this video, we will only pick a handful which achieved the highest score using the CVLP model. But more on this in the next video. And as always, I'm looking forward to seeing you in the next video in part three.